behalf of Miguel Alumni Association of Turkey, I would like to welcome everyone uh, join, for joining us today for a conversation with Professor, former Miguel Professor Fethelian Mogadon. Uh, Professor Mogadon will be delivering his talk uh, titled Political Plasticity and the Future of Democracy and Dictatorship, uh, which will be followed by a question and answer and discussion session. Uh, an outline of Professor Mogadam's talk today has been uh, shared with all the participants earlier, uh, along with the Zoom link. Uh, and in case you missed that, uh, we will be sharing the link again on the chat box. And uh, my fellow Megillian and Associate Professor of Political Science at Bozici University, Zeynep Kadir Beyoğlu, uh, will be helping us uh, in moderating the question and answer and discussion sessions today. And uh, we kindly ask everyone to keep themselves muted uh, during Professor Mogadam's talk. And uh, we'd also like to remind uh, that participants need to digitally raise their hands uh, to ask questions uh, after Professor Mogadam's talk. And to make sure that everyone who wishes to ask questions can do so, we kindly ask you to keep your questions under 90 seconds. And you may also type your questions uh, and or comments in the chat box if you prefer to do so. And uh, if you would like to remain anonymous, please send your questions and or comments to one of the co-hosts during um, the talk uh, or during the discussion session uh, using the chat box function. And uh, I would now like to introduce our speaker today, Fatali Mogattam. Uh, Professor Mogadam was born in Iran, educated from an early age in England and worked for the United Nations and for McGill University. Uh, he later joined Georgetown University in 1990 and uh, he was a witness of the Spring of Revolution in Iran in 1979 and conducted research there during the hostage crisis and the early years of the Iran-Iraq war. His experimental and field research on radicalization, intergroup conflict, human rights and duties, and the psychology of dictatorship and democracy uh, in numerous culture contexts have been published extensively. And uh, he formulated the staircase to terrorism and springboard to dictatorship models, which continue to be used in international research and practice. Uh, his work has also inspired recently released Netflix documentary series, um, How to Become a Tyrant. And without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Mogadam. Thank you again for accepting our uh, request to join us today, Professor Mogadam. Well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted and honored to be with you. Uh, like you, I am um, very much um, part of McGill still, and I have very fond memories of the years at McGill, uh, which is a world-class university that um, encourages us to think critically and broadly and deeply. Uh, what I'd like to do is share some ideas with you today for about 25 minutes, and then uh, engage in a discussion. Um, and the ideas I'm sharing with you are really uh, part of what I'm thinking about right now. They're part of what I struggle with. And I want to begin by just alerting you that I'm going to stay with the outline that I've sent. So if you look at that outline, and it has further readings as well, there's a list of further readings. Uh, I'm going to stick with that uh, outline. And I want to start with a quotation from um, the last chapter of this new book of mine. It's, it sounds irrelevant to our discussion. It's called Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist. But actually, it's very relevant to what we discussed today. Uh, the chapter that I'm going to quote from is chapter 11, and it's on Julius Caesar. And the first quote is from Donald Trump. Trump, during the 2016 U.S. presidential election, said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose voters. Interesting statement from Trump. 
I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue, he's talking about New York, of course, and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose a vote. That's the first quote. The second quote comes from the play Julius Caesar, uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And it, it's a quote from Casca. Casca is uh, one of the characters in Julius Caesar who looks at the situation, recognizes that Julius Caesar is coming up to become a dictator. And Casca is one of the pro-republic characters. He doesn't want a dictatorship. And he, he is there looking at Caesar's supporters. And he makes a very interesting comment about the supporters of Caesar. He says, look at those supporters. Look at the way they hanker after they support Caesar. He says, um, if Caesar had stabbed their mothers, if Caesar had stabbed their mothers, uh, they would continue to support him. Very similar sentiment to what Trump says. Trump says, I could have shot somebody on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose a voter. And here's Casca saying, look at Caesar's supporters. Caesar could stab their mothers and they would still continue to support him. In my studies of dictatorship, one of the very striking themes that comes to life for me is the consistency, the continuation of certain themes in dictatorships across thousands of years. If you go back thousands of, thousands of years, you see the same themes continuing. And one of these themes is the strongman dictator, the charismatic strongman dictator, who manages to mobilize a large number of people to support him in an enthusiastic and uninhibited way. So that no matter what he does, it does not matter. I'm reminded of uh, the 2016 election again in, in the United States where Revelation after revelation came out about Donald Trump having accosted, having attacked women, having raped them. And his supporters came out and chanted, we don't care. We don't care. And it reminds me again of, of Casca's statement about Julius Caesar, that his supporters don't care. He could stab their mothers and they wouldn't care. My focus here is on the historic support for strongmen, authoritarian dictators, and why this takes place. As a psychologist, this to me is a huge challenge. Why is it that we get large numbers of people supporting these strongmen dictators? And it's a particular challenge for modern psychology because like most psychologists, I was trained to work in a laboratory. And most of my research has been done in very short-term experiments typically in a laboratory context. And now I'm trying to move from this very small scale research to talk about these very wide historic trends, such as the continuation of the influence that these strongmen dictators have. 
if we look historically, these strongmen dictators, first of all, are almost all male. Second, most of them are charismatic. Third, most of them are very instinctive and emotional in their actions. I'm going to come back to this. Let me now talk about the context we're in. In the 21st century, we have to keep in mind the context of globalization. This is a very important feature of our lives. Globalization is, I believe, the most important factor impacting our lives, although most of us don't realize it. The world is globalizing in the sense that right now, there are two major factors that drive change. One is technology. Like it or not, technology is driving our lives to change. Uh, I remember when I first arrived at McGill in 1984, I used to go to do my statistical analyses on a mainframe computer, IBM, that was absolutely enormous. And we used to uh, punch cards and put these cards into the machine and get reams of paper out. Well, now students just sit down behind a little laptop and they produce so much more than I ever did. Technology is changing our lives, and this is not in our control. It is not in the control of any government. It is driven by factors that are beyond our reasonable controls. The second factor that is driving globalization is economic integration. No matter how much we try, we are becoming more and more integrated into a global economy. And these two factors are driving change. And I believe are part of the discussion about the decline of democracy and the rise of dictatorial forces. If we look at the last 20, 30 years, there is no doubt that democracy is under threat, not just in a few countries, but around the world. If you look at the indices produced by uh, the credible sources, uh, such as Freedom House in the U United Kingdom, such as other indices produced by uh, The Economist and other sources, the quality of democracy is declining in most countries. Uh, journalists Without Borders have produced very good indices of this. Freedom of journalists has declined, not just in non-Western, but also in Western countries. Uh, right now in the United States, I would say democracy is under threat in very serious ways. Um, for example, large sections of the Republican Party still claim that the 2020 election was a fraud. Now, this is a problem for democracy when you have mainstream politicians making such outrageous claims. It is not just in the West, it is not just in the non-Western countries, but around the world, we have a decline in democratic processes. And we have a rise in dictatorial powers such as China and Russia. And of course, the smaller dictatorships such as North Korea and Iran are very influential as well. And then we have a whole number of countries where 20, 30, 40 years ago, it seemed that democracy was improving, but now they've gone backwards. And you know that there are dozens of countries in that category. 
some of them are in a tragic situation. Uh, for example, I taught in Caracas, Venezuela, when Chavez uh, was, came to power. And um, over the last 20 years or so, that country has gone backwards. So this is a global trend. And the question is, uh, why is it that we have this trend and what can we do about it? One of the other things to keep in mind is that in terms of the authoritarian strongman, these strongmen who have arisen in power in a number of countries, we have to keep in mind their basic instincts. They have an instinctual tendency to try to concentrate power and what people like me do in empirical research, they don't need because they instinctively know what to do. For example, uh, I studied, um, I'd researched in Iran after the revolution when Khomeini came. Uh, Khomeini was instinctively a dictator. And one of the things he realized very quickly was that if he could focus attention on threat, and he focused attention particularly on the threat of America and Israel, if he could galvanize the public to focus on threat, then he could mobilize support for his dictatorship, which he brought about within a year. Uh, when I first went back to Iran with the revolution in 79, we had complete freedom. Uh, women in Iran were initially free. They were not forced to wear the hijab. They could be active in politics. There was great euphoria and great um, optimism. But within a year, the instincts that Khomeini followed led to suppression and dictatorship, which we know exists today in Iran, unfortunately. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is that a characteristic of the strongman dictator is this instinctive tendency to want to concentrate power and end freedoms. This is their natural tendency, and this is their rise uh, in a situation where dictatorship becomes possible for them. In a recent book called Threat to Democracy, The Appeal of Authoritarianism in an Age of Uncertainty, which I've listed in the further readings, I've argued that the potential dictator conveys a message about two types of freedom. The type of freedom that you and I enjoy, would like to enjoy at least, and which we support is what I call detached freedom. This involves freedom of expression, freedom of movement, all kinds of human rights freedoms that we uh, will find under the UN Declaration of Human Rights. However, the potential dictator advocates a very different type of freedom. Uh, actually, Hitler is probably the best conveyor of this message. If you listen to Hitler's speeches and, and listen to him carefully, what you find is that instead of individual freedom, Hitler advocates freedom through the group. That is what I call attached freedom. The idea that through the group, through merging yourself within the group, through losing yourself within the group, through becoming one of the mass following the leader, you can gain glory. You can gain freedom in a collective way. And this is an effort by the dictator to mobilize the group, make America great again, 
Making America great again means merging yourself within that America that Donald Trump is leading. And of course, only he can lead it. Similarly with the Third Reich, similarly with the Islamic Republic of Iran. In all these cases, what you have is a potential or actual dictator conveying the message that the way forward to freedom is through merging yourself within the group and becoming part of the glory of the collective. And of course, uh, the potential dictator conveys the message that only he can lead the collective. It is only through his leadership that you can succeed. This is part of the narcissistic feature of the potential dictator. Uh, potential and actual dictators have a number of personality characteristics, such as Machiavellianism, such as being power hungry. But one of the most important features of these men is their narcissism. Uh, they tend to be extremely nar narcissistic, pathologically so. The world revolves around them, and only they can save the group and lead the group to glory. So this is a, a very important aspect of their characteristics. And the two types of freedom you'll find advocated uh, very much by every one of these types of potential dictators or actual dictators. Now, one of the concepts I want to introduce today is that of pl political plasticity. Political plasticity, which means how much and how fast can we change political behavior? Of course, as a psychologist, Behavior is central to everything I do. Psychology is about understanding and influencing behavior. And one of the issues for us as political examiners is how much behavioral change can we achieve in the political arena and how fast. This is important because we are all pro-democracy and we have our democratic ideals. We want a society where there is mass participation in democracy. But in order to achieve that, we have to bring about certain changes. And the question is, how much can we change behavior and how fast? This becomes particularly important when we think about revolutionary ideals and revolutions. In the last uh, century, we've had um, a number of important revolutions. Uh, just uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have, of course, the 1917 Russian Revolution. Then we've had a spate of recent revolutions, including the Arab Spring Revolution in Iran, uh, in between, we had revolutions such as the Cuban Revolution. All these revolutions have their ideals. And the goal of revolutionaries is to bring about behavioral change to meet their ideals. For example, uh, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, these people attempted to bring about behavioral change so that collective ownership could be functional and replace personal ownership. Now, that kind of behavioral change requires time and it requires dramatic changes in programs. In Iran, after the 1979 revolution, we had attempts to change the behavior of the people and those attempts are continuing to make the behavior of the people more Islamic as Khomeini interpreted Islamic. So we have this challenge 
in every revolution of changing behavior as democratic supporting people, we have the challenge of changing behavior towards greater democracy. We want greater freedom. We want greater justice. How do we achieve this? Uh, in a book on the psychology of democracy, I mapped out 10 characteristics of the democratic citizen. And I argued that these are the characteristics we need to try to achieve over the long term in order to form a democracy, in order to achieve a society where the citizens can support and participate in a democracy. For example, the characteristics of the democratic citizen for me begin with admitting that I could be wrong. That is the starting point. And then it goes on to other characteristics. But a question that I have for you is, given the state of affairs in our populations, given the education systems that we have, what is the limitation in terms of political plasticity? How fast and how much can we change behavior towards democracy? How much time do we need? I started with quotations uh, spanning across time, one of them from Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. I could have gone back to Athens 2,500 years ago and highlighted the same themes. One of my arguments is that in discussing political systems, we are often blind to the length of time it takes to bring about change. We often forget that human behavior is very resistant to change in some areas. One of the examples of those areas is leadership. For example, I ask, why is it that we still need leaders in our societies? We now have the technology to bring about mass participation in decision making. We could have mass participation in decisions such as, should we go to war? Should we raise taxes? All these could be decided by mass participation, but we do not do that. In the United States and most Western countries, decision-making is by a very select elite. And in many cases, it is one person who decides. George Bush decided to launch wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. If he had been against those wars, they would not have happened. So there are certain areas of political plasticity where change is very limited. For example, we still do not have a woman in the White House. Why is that? Most of the students in our universities and many of the professors are female. Why is it that in politics and in leadership specifically, females are not there? So this is an area in political plasticity where there is great resistance to change. I want to now look forward to the rest of this century because I'm talking about long-term trends. There's no doubt in my mind that this century is the century where the struggle between dictatorships and democracies will be the major theme. I'm not going to try to predict whether by the end of this century dictatorships or democracies win out. I think it's a difficult, very difficult uh, decision to make which one of them will win out. China is 
a very strong dictatorship. Uh, it was imagined that once the Chinese middle class expands, China will become more democratic. That has not happened. I have not seen any signs of democratization at all. In fact, it's been quite the reverse. I was in China some years ago giving talks and there was more hope at that time. Now it seems to me with a lifelong dictator in place, there is no possibility that I see of China moving towards democracy. I see Russia uh, with, the, uh, with Tsar Putin in place very much moving towards greater dictatorship. I see other countries uh, following that route. And the question is, over the next 80 years or so of this century, how will the struggle between democracies and dictatorships continue? And I see this struggle as deadly because I believe that uh, one side or the other is going to come out on top and there is no telling which side will win. Uh, but I see political plasticity as central to this struggle because at the heart of this struggle is the issue of how much we can change political behavior, particularly in terms of leadership. And uh, I worry about not just non-Western countries, but Western countries where leadership still tends to be very much in the line of the authoritarian strongman rather than more open, uh, democratic, freedom-oriented leadership. Uh, let me stop there and start the discussion with you. Uh, my comments have been very broad and um, uh, I could go into more details as we discuss.